And therefore, it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom without your asking, desiring, begging, pleading, demanding. There is no need to go to God with words or with thoughts, for God knows our thoughts even before we do. God knows the intents of the heart. God is not a superhuman being. God does not make rules for one person and not for another. God does not break its rules. God cannot make exceptions. God is not a God of certain people. God is a God unto God's universe and God's love is equal. God's love is supreme. God's grace is available to all equally all of the time. No one by asking God can secure anything of God or from God. There is only one way to receive God's grace and that is first of all to understand that God is the infinite wisdom and God is the divine love and therefore our only need is to close the eyes be still speak Lord thy servant heareth and then be still be quiet be receptive and let God's grace flow. God does not hear human speech. If God heard human speech, everyone who reaches out to God and says, Oh, God save me, would be saved. Everyone who says, Oh, God give me this or give me that, might receive it but God does not hear or respond to human speech God searches the heart God knoweth the heart and God's grace flows into the heart that is open to receive him Only in meditation, only in inner stillness can we prepare our consciousness to receive God's grace. For we do not receive it, we do not respond to it, except as we have created a place within us to receive, to welcome to commune, to tabernacle with God. One of the greatest barriers that we ourselves set up to prevent God reaching us is the very belief that we can go to God for something and we can't we never can go to God for anything yes we can and we can waste our whole lives doing it but we cannot go with any anticipation of receiving there is only one way to go to God and that is to know him aright. 
whom to know aright is life eternal. There is only one way to go to God, and that is for the experience of communing with God, of hearing God, Students very often forget when they go to their spiritual teacher that they should go to hear and not to speak. There is not much they can tell the spiritual teacher that the teacher does not already know. But they can learn much if they go to listen, to hear, to receive and the student who goes to the spiritual teacher open receptive responsive they receive this is much more true when you go to God there is no room for telling God anything and no time should be wasted in trying to tell God as if God didn't already know all that we have in our hearts. To go to God, let us go ten times, a thousand times more silent than we would go to our teacher. Let us go to God in the complete assurance that God needs no help from us, that we need the help from God, and uh, that God does not need to be told, God does not need to be coaxed like a child trying to get an extra chocolate from Mama. God is not a super Mama or a super Papa that sits there withholding from us while we beg and plead for it. God is never withholding from us. God is forever expressing. When we go out into the sun, we never ask the sun for light or for heat we know that the sun is expressing light and heat and if we go into the sun we will receive light and we will receive warmth God is wisdom and God is love and when we go into God we receive wisdom and we receive love God has none of these to withhold, only these to express. In meditation, then, we silence the human mind with its desires, fears, doubts, and in quietness and in confidence, we go to God knowing that in that inner communion with God there will be a free flow of God's grace. It is for this reason that meditation plays probably the largest part of the experience of an infinite way student. Our students are taught that from the very beginning of coming to this message they must learn to have four or five or six periods every single day for meditation even if these periods may be two minutes, three minutes or five minutes. We find that gradually, instead of three, four, or five p 
periods of meditation, eventually we have 10 and 12 and 20. We learn also that some of these may be of one minute duration or 30 seconds, but then that some of these stretch out into 10 or 12 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Not at the beginning, it isn't wise to meditate for more than two or three minutes in the beginning because no one can keep their thoughts still. No one can be inwardly still for more than two or three minutes until they have, through experience, learned how to be still inside. Oh, there are some who have other backgrounds there are some who have had a religious life and who can be still for longer periods but I'm addressing this primarily to those to whom meditation is something new or inner stillness is something new or who those who have not yet learned that there is no use talking to God in prayer or in meditation The great spiritual fruitage that comes into our lives through meditation comes because we have learned how to be still, how to listen. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. The word of God is quick and sharp and powerful but you see it is the word of God that is quick and sharp and powerful not the word of man talking to God this has no value and no power but the word of God that comes to us this is power he uttereth his voice the earth melteth when we are inwardly still, even though we may not hear any voice, it may not be an audible voice, we do receive an inner feeling of peace, of release, of joy, of warmth. We receive an inner assurance that God is on the field. Meditation, then, must become the way of life to an infinite way student. Now, there are many ways of attaining the ability to meditate and to hear the voice of God. The simplest way is the way of contemplative meditation or the way of practicing the presence of God. We learn in this message that when we awaken in the morning, even before we rise out of bed, that there must be an interval of two or three or four or five minutes in which we consciously acknowledge God. God is here and God is now. God has given us this day. God is the strength of my day. God is the wisdom of my day. The presence of God goes before me throughout this day. The wisdom of God guides me. The love of God is ever with me. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Just these couple of minutes of acknowledging God's presence, God's power, God's grace, can change the entire nature of the day that we live. Whereas, getting up 
without this just means that we're getting up in our humanhood. We are not getting up in the God consciousness, in the consciousness of God. We are not preparing our day in the consciousness of God. Without this morning practice, we are just getting up as physical beings under the direction of whatever wind may blow. But to acknowledge God in all thy ways means to bring the law of God, the life of God, the presence of God, into your experience. And right here I must tell you one of the principles that started this message. If you look out at this world, or if you look back upon the years of the past, and think of the discords, the inharmonies, the sins or the diseases or the lack which you have witnessed either in your own experience or the experience of others in the world, you must naturally wonder how can this be if there is a God? And this was the question that started me on this search. And when the answer came, it came this way none of these things would have happened to anybody except that they lived their lives separate and apart from God. That doesn't mean that they may not have gone to church and gone through all the rituals and rites and ceremonies, but those things have no relationship to God whatsoever. They are meaningless in the sight of God. When Jesus was baptized, he must have had a tremendous smile on his face because he said, suffer it to be so now. He must have thought it very strange that enlightened people believed in uh, the power of any external exercise or rite or ritual to move God. It was in the same way that, of course you know that baptism was a rite of one sect of the Hebrews. That's how it came into the Christian world from the Judaic world. It isn't a Christian ceremony, it's a Jewish ceremony but it was taken over into part of the Christian world. Why, I don't suppose anyone knows, because it was smiled at by the master, suffered just because the ignorant wanted it that way. Circumcision was one of the very strongest of the laws of the Hebrew church, still is. But Paul said very definitely, circumcision or uncircumcision availeth nothing. Those rites, those ceremonies, they mean nothing. They are outer things that have no inner significance, really have nothing to do with God. In all of the three years ministry of the master we find that he tried to stop every one of the rites and rituals of the church he was rebuked for his attitude on the sabbath and he laughed at that one too man wasn't made for the sabbath sabbath was made for man Sacrifices, he wiped them out of his teaching. The 
bringing of gifts into the temple. He wiped it out of his teaching. Everything that placed man's reliance on something external, he wiped out. He even told the Hebrews that there was no benefit in the praying in holy mountains or holy temples, that there was no need to go here or to go there to pray, for the kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. The kingdom of God is within you. He even told the Hebrews that they must not pray to be seen of men. They must go in their inner sanctuary and pray in secret. The Father that seeth in secret will reward thee openly. He told them not to bring those gifts of money to the temple, not to build those temples. Do your benevolences secretly, silently, and the Father that seeth in secret will reward thee openly. In other words, the Master was trying to convey to the people of his day that if you would be led by God, if you would be directed, healed, protected, it must not be by conforming to the laws of men, but to the laws of God. And he taught those laws. First of all, never to pray to God for things. What you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or wherewithal you shall be clothed. Seek only the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things you'll have. He taught that you must not only pray for your friends, but more especially if you would be children of God, that you must pray for your enemies. He taught that we must not hold sinners in condemnation as the church did. Why, the church excommunicated people for sin. The church stoned people to death for sin. And he said this is wrong. Forgive 70 times 7. As a matter of fact, the greatest crime in all of Judaism throughout all time has been the crime of adultery. Everything else could be understood. Everything else could be quickly forgiven. But adultery, the Hebrews have never been able to understand or even to forgive. And for that reason, they made the penalty for adultery being stoned to death. But not the master. The master said, neither do I condemn thee. In other words, in every way he tried to separate us from human ways of religious worship and turn us to the spiritual way. Pray for your friends, yes, but pray more for your enemies. Forgive sinners. Forgive those who persecute you. Forgive those who in any way malign you. Never, never do to another what they do to you, but only what you would have them do unto you. The Master knew that giving is one of the greatest life-giving experiences that one can have. He knew that the very act of giving 
was what opened one's heart and soul and consciousness to receiving God's grace. He knew that a heart that wasn't open, a mind that wasn't open to give, give and forgive, was closed to God's grace. And yet, he wouldn't allow that giving to be commercialized. He wouldn't allow it to be the means of purchasing God's favors, nor even man's favors. That was why he taught that prayer was to be in secret and giving was to be in secret so that we did nothing to glorify our human self. Oh, it is so easy to give our benevolences in a way that reflects credit back upon us and the praise of man, but little do we realize that we are forfeiting God's grace every time that we seek the praise of men, the honor of men, the recognition of men. You find as you follow the teachings of the Master that he tried to break us of the habit of conforming to what men believed and compelled us to go within and there trust that the all-knowing mind, the all-knowing intelligence, the divine love which God is, would in silence and in secrecy know the purposes and the intents of our heart and our reward would be in accord with that not with what we said or openly did. He knew long before Emerson that what you are shrieks so loudly I cannot hear what you say. He knew that God knew not by the utterances of our lips but by the actions of our heart, of our soul, of our inner being just what measure of God we could respond to. So you'll find then that if in the morning on waking you spend two or three or four minutes acknowledging God's grace, thy grace today is my sufficiency in all things. Thy presence goes before me. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Those few minutes will bring the entire experience of God into your daily life. You won't have to pray for anything or ask for anything or expect anything. It will be there before you need it. In the same way, to acknowledge God as the source whether of the food on our table, the money in the bank, the position we occupy, to acknowledge God as the source, again, takes from us the egotism that would have us believe that we are something and that we are responsible for this beauty in our lives or this prosperity in our lives or this health or success. Our students learn that they must never say grace for the food on their tables. To some of them, this is a startling experience at first, but they soon learn the value of it. Our thanks is not for food on the table. Our thanks is for the God that produces the food. 
Our thanks is never for the money in our pockets, but for the God who owns all money. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And every time that you thank God, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, you are acknowledging the source and you are praying aright. Whenever I see beauty such as this, these flowers, and that which welcomed us in our room here yesterday, a room filled with flowers and with fruit, with candy. Oh, the flowers were beautiful and the fruit tasted well, but to me, to us, the grandeur was in the love that was behind these flowers and behind the fruit, the love that prompted their being sent. That to me was the great thing, the love that God had planted in the hearts of those who loved the message of the infinite way and wanted to express their love in these forms. I acknowledge the beauty and I acknowledge the taste. But above all things, I acknowledge the love that God has placed in the hearts of those who wish to show forth that love in a tangible form. That is more important than this because maybe tomorrow or the next day this will be gone, but that love will still be there ready to set a table in the wilderness. So it is, you eat the food on your table and then say, now I have nothing left to be grateful for. The food's all gone. That isn't true. It is never true. The gratitude is for that which brought forth that food. Then when the food is gone, the presence and power of God is still there to multiply and to multiply. I think often of our farmers or our fruit uh, growers who so often mistakenly thank God for the crop on the tree or in the ground and then have a wind come up the next day and blow it away and then wonder why they thank God and what for. Of course, when we stop to think, does it make any difference what happens to the flowers, the fruit, the crops? When God is forever busy multiplying again and again and again, and as fast as these disappear, if God is there, more will appear. Many people have destroyed themselves because wars or depressions took from them their possessions because their vision went no further than seeing those possessions. And many of them have a hard time regaining possessions, whereas it would be so easy and it has been easy for many who have been able to say what difference does it make God's grace is my sufficiency and manna falls day by day we need not live on yesterday's manna whatever was taken from us today will grow again tomorrow the same God that gave it to us yesterday will give it to us tomorrow as long as we can acknowledge the source. I'm afraid too often though we have believed that we created those possessions, our brains, our intelligence, our strength, not realizing that all that is comes from God. Acknowledge him in all thy ways and he will give thee peace. When we begin this practice, 
waking in the morning, eating with every meal, always remembering God as the source. God is the substance. Then we learn that as we go about our duties, whether in business, art, profession, or home, always remembering thy grace is my sufficiency in all things. Thy grace is. Thy grace is. Each day becomes a new day. And out of our consciousness springs new blessings every day. Every day. We need not think of yesterday's manna. Sufficient unto today is the need thereof and the grace thereof. As we continue to find opportunities throughout the day and the night for this remembering God as the source, remembering God as the protection Remembering God as our intelligence, as the love, we gradually build within ourselves an inner quiet, an inner peace, because we lose anxieties and fears. There is no more comforting thought in all the world than the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's a wonderful thing to know that God possesses all there is. Especially when a little bit later he says, And son, all that I have is thine. Oh, it's so beautiful then to know. All there is belongs to God, and all that belongs to God is mine. It's so direct. It's so continuous. It's so permanent. That inwardly you come to that same state of being in which we find David the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want no anxiety there no doubt no fear the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want no 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 reaching no praying no desiring no fearing no doubting just the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so as we begin to perceive that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the only purpose of this earth is to show forth God's glory, show forth God's handiwork, and God's greatest creation is man, showing forth all of the beauty, all of the grace, all of the presence of God. Now, with fear removed, with doubt removed, and with this inner assurance, God's grace is my sufficiency in all things. There comes this inner peace and stillness so that now when you sit down to meditate, you don't even have to sit down you can do it while you're driving your car or doing your housework or out in business but you learn to be receptive to keep an ear open and then you find that you are praying without words and without thoughts your prayer is just an open ear into which God flows God's grace flows and God's grace flows as a sufficiency in all things this is prayer this is the prayer of spiritual fruitage what James called the prayer of a righteous man the prayer of a righteous man availeth much when we have come to that place in life where we do our benevolences in secret, where we do our praying in secret, where we spend much time forgiving 70 times 7, where we learn not to judge, not to criticize, not to condemn, where we learn to acknowledge God in all our ways, 
this, this is being the righteous man, and this is praying the prayer of a righteous man, and then all that is necessary is that listening ear, speak, Lord, thy servant, hear us. And when God utters his voice, the whole earth felt it. The word of God is quick and sharp and powerful. Therefore, let us pray to be receptive to the word of God. It is for this reason, then, that the two books, The Art of Meditation and Practicing the Presence, really are the books that prepare us for the rest of the message, because there is no way, even of reading the books or hearing uh, the classes, there is no way of receiving their blessing unless we have learned not to hear with the ears or think with the mind, but to receive the message through our inner discernment, our spiritual awareness. In other words, what we receive in quietness and in confidence, this becomes the law of God unto our experience. Not what we receive through the brain, not what we receive through the intellect, but what we receive in quietness and in confidence. So before we can benefit at all by such a message as that of the infinite way, we must first learn to receive the message with the mind still. Not racing around trying to understand or interpret, but rather to let the words fall upon our ears and interpret themselves to us and this only takes place when we read them or hear them in inner stillness silence quietness peacefulness and assurance lives are changed not by asking God for favors Lives are changed by coming into God's presence in stillness and letting the presence of God take over and do with us as we will. If you ask me for help, I don't try to go to God and tell him what you need or what I think you ought to have. I don't try to influence God on your behalf. All of that I think of as a waste of time. When you ask for help, I go to God in stillness, in silence, and I realize this. You would never need to go to anyone if the presence and power of God were functioning in your life. Therefore, let me be still. Let me be a transparency through which God's presence and power touches your life. And then God, who is the real intelligence of this universe and the real love, will take your lives and mold them in its own image and likeness. I can't do this for you. No man can. No woman can. Only God can. And uh, the only individual who can succeed in bringing the grace of God into your experience is the one who knows enough to know that they cannot influence God they cannot tell God. They cannot enlighten God. They can only be still. 
The cleanest window pane lets in the most light and warmth from the sun. And so the individual who has learned to be still lets the activity and the presence and the power of God come through into your experience and pick it up and then God transforms your life from whatever it may have been it transformed the woman taken in adultery into a follower of the master it turned the thief on the cross evidently into an angel for the master took him this very night into heaven it transformed uh, Lazarus from a corpse to a living, walking, thinking individual. It lifted many cripples out of uh, their paralysis, their deformities, into harmonious men and women. Now the master didn't do those things and he said so. I can of my own self do nothing. The father within me, he doeth the works. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. For this doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Some people recently have been greatly shocked because in these Dead Sea Scrolls which have now been translated they have discovered that it was literally true that the message was not that of the Master that it existed hundreds of years before he was on earth and he was merely repeating just as he repeated the two great commandments Thou shalt have no other gods. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, which was only taken from the book of Exodus, from the Ten Commandments. And the second commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself, was taken even before that from the book of Leviticus. And so he was literally telling the truth when he said, my doctrine is not mine. This is the word of God unto all men through all generations. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Yesterday <clears throat> we took up the two important points practicing the presence and the art of meditation. <clears throat> meditation is that conscious act that takes place within us when I and the Father <clears throat> become consciously one. Now, the relationship is that I and the Father are one. This is a relationship that has always existed. This exists whether you are <clears throat> a saint walking the earth like Jesus Christ or whether you are the sinner who was crucified for his theft. I and the Father are still one. But in one case, that of Jesus, the relationship has been fully realized and thereby demonstrated. That is, in proportion as we consciously, knowingly, are one with the Father, in that degree does it become literally true in our experience that all that the Father hath is mine. 
That is the relationship disclosed by the Master in the 15th chapter of John, where he tells us that if you abide in me, if you let me abide in you, the word, truth, you will bear fruit richly, for you are the branch and I am the vine. And when we are one with I at the center of our being, then we are one with God and the spiritual fruitage flows into visible expression. When we exist as human beings do, this relationship of oneness with God bears no fruitage. In other words, you are then as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. Now, in any event, we are branches, and in any event, Christ, our spiritual identity, I, in the midst of me, is the vine. And therefore, my humanhood, which is the branch, when it is consciously connected with the I that I am, is then one with God. And God, through Christ, through the I that I am, manifests this spiritual harmony, health, wholeness, completeness, perfection, joy, peace, dominion, abundance, as spiritual fruitage. When, however, we live as a human being, we are still the branch, but we are as if we were a branch cut off that withereth because the connecting link with God is consciousness. The connecting link with God is knowing the truth. Ye shall know the truth truth and the truth shall make you free. The connecting link, remember, is not worshiping in holy mountains nor holy temples. The connecting link is not going through ceremonies, rites, or rituals. The connecting link is ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the truth that you know is your conscious realization of your relationship to God. At first, you may only know this with the mind. That is, you may hear it from somebody's lips or you may read it in somebody's books. If you have been prepared by God what you have heard or read will ring true to you it will seem to you as if ah this is it this is what I have sought this is what I have known then you are at the first step of your demonstration because now you have at least with the mind been led to the truth but by the grace of God you have been prepared to receive it so that you can take the next step and the next step is the one that is conscious realization of your oneness with God and that takes place through meditation or in meditation. Since meditation is not natural or normal to the Westerner,
it becomes necessary for us to find a way to attain the ability to meditate. Naturally, since we are all different states and states, stages of consciousness, what may suit one may not suit another, and many will have to find their own way to attain the ability to meditate and to become consciously one with God. However, many of our students have found that the way we are teaching in the infinite way has been of help to them and has enabled them to make their demonstration of meditation and contact. And we have two approaches to that and those two approaches constituted our lesson yesterday. First, practicing the presence of God, living consciously throughout the day in the acknowledgement of God's presence and power and jurisdiction. And then after practicing the presence for enough days or weeks or months and finding that we are now able to attain a greater sense of stillness within, then becoming quiet, and eventually achieving that moment of contact. The first contact may be a very light one that almost passes unnoticed, and certainly goes by so quickly we hardly have time to capture it. But as we persist in our meditations, those periods of contact become more frequent and then eventually last longer until they result in an actual communion with God, which is the step after meditation. After we have been able to succeed in an inner meditation, an inner stillness and quietness wherein we are enabled to listen for that still small voice, to listen while God speaks to us. In that meditation wherein we are receptive and responsive to whatever spiritual impulse may come from the Father within, eventually <clears throat> that becomes another activity, one that we know as communion. And it is one in which after we have attained meditation, we are enabled for a longer period of time. It may be three, five, or ten minutes. It may be an hour. In which there is an inner communion that takes place as if there were two of us, I and my father, Joel and my father. And it is as if Joel were aware of this gentle presence, gentle influence, and then of a Joel going back to that influence, to that presence, and thereby a flow, a flow from Joel to the Father and from the Father to Joel. And it is not necessarily words, it is really more a feeling an awareness of a very gentle spiritual presence and of a flow going back and forth. It doesn't mean that I and my father are two. It doesn't mean that there is a God and a me. It really means that I have made contact with my source, that is, the wellspring the inner self. Scripture says, I and my Father are one, 
yet the Father is greater than I. And that's exactly what we mean. That this communion within ourselves is not with something separate and apart from ourselves. It isn't even a separate being. It is really our self, spelt with a capital S. And the Joel part of us is our self, spelt with a small s. And so this self is really communing with itself, but with two different degrees of selfhood. One the outer and one the inner. One the causative and the other the effect. This that is within us, this gentle presence, the Spirit of God, is the causative part of us. It is that which projects us into life and then feeds us, maintains us, sustains us, directs us, leads us, guides us, and governs us once we have come under its influence. Humanhood is a person separate and apart from that and therefore getting along on their own wisdom or their own money or their own guidance or their own direction. That is why they wither us. But when we have returned to the Father's house, that is, when we have returned within and made conscious contact with that infinite invisible it is as if the reservoir which has been cut off from the stream that feeds it had once again become reunited. And so the stream again flows into the reservoir and not only fills it but purifies it. A reservoir of water would soon stagnate and also diminish if it weren't continually being fed by a stream. So with us, we would soon starve spiritually and eventually physically if it weren't that we are fed from an inner stream of life, a wellspring of water. But as humans, we aren't. As humans, we're cut off from it. And that is why we have problems. That is why we have discords. Because we are getting along without the source of life, the source of harmony. But, first of all, through this practicing the presence of God, which means through acknowledging him in all our ways, which means keeping the mind stayed on God, which means recognizing God as the source of our good, as the omnipresence and omnipotence of our experience, this leads us to the inner stillness whereby meditation takes place. And this in turn leads us to an actual communion with that source in which we begin to receive divine impartations. Now it was in the periods of communion that Jesus could receive the word which he imparted to his disciples. Now let us think for a moment of some of these words so that we can accept the lesson that he was giving them. I am the bread of life. I am the wine and the water. I am the resurrection. I am life eternal I will never leave thee nor forsake thee I will be with thee unto the end of the world 
I go before thee to prepare a place for thee. Now, a man could not make up statements like that out of his brain because they would be meaningless. In fact, they would be as meaningless as the interpretation that has been placed on them by the church. They would have you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and the resurrection and the bread and the wine and the water and never, never once did he make such a statement. There isn't one single recorded statement in all scriptural literature that would even imply that he meant such a thing because over and over and over he said, I can of my own self do nothing. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. It should have been made clear then that when he said, I am the bread of life, that that is exactly what he meant. I am. Not Jesus is. You would be horrified if you heard someone said, Mary is the bread of life, or Joel is the bread of life, or James is the bread of life. You would know better than that because you know that God is no respecter of persons. That God could never set aside one person as being different than every other person who is the child of God. And so it is that you must understand that Jesus was giving us the absolute spiritual truth which he had received of his Father. This doctrine is not mine. I'm not inventing it. I'm not making it up. This doctrine is of the Father that sent me. And what does it say? It says, I am the bread of life. I am life eternal. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will be with thee to the end of the world. Now a man who is about to be crucified and buried and make an ascension isn't going to be with you to the end of the world. He says, if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. So he's not planning on Jesus being with you unto the end of the world. He is planning on I. The same I that Moses declared when he said, I am that I am. The same I that Jesus declared when he said, I am that I am. The same I that every mystic has declared, there is but one I, one ego, one divine infinite being which I am. Am. I in the midst of me is mighty. Whithersoever thou goest, I will go. If you mount up to heaven, I am there. If you make your bed in hell, I am there. If you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil, for I am there. And so, in meditation, in communion, eventually you become aware of a divine presence within you. And you need not be surprised if sometimes you hear it declare, I am here, or I am with you, or I am the light of the world, 
or I will never leave you. Because as you continue on this path, it must inevitably happen. For that presence is within you. Before Abraham was, it was established in you. And it will be with you unto the end of the world. And it will never leave you. It will never forsake you. The reason that this truth was lost was because it could be misunderstood, misinterpreted, and violated. When Moses received the great illumination, I, I am, there is no God outside. There is no God in heaven. God is in the midst of thee, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. I am. Don't be afraid to open your mouth, for I will put the words there. And he became aware then that that word I meant this mystical presence, this divine presence, the spiritual I that I am. Whether or not he was immediately given the wisdom to know that this must never be told to human beings, we don't know. He may have had the experience that later mystics had, of immediately telling this to the world and uh, having them believe that they were all gods and start a movement. It's a very dangerous thing when human beings declare that I am God. It's apt to drive them crazy until they believe it. And then we have another dictator on our hands national or in the family. But it's very sad when an individual gets the idea that a human being is some kind of a mighty something or other and even God. How Moses learned his wisdom we may not know but we do know this that he learned it and that he passed the law that none of the Hebrews were ever to learn the name of God. They were to be given a substitute name. They were to be allowed to use a half a dozen names. But never could they learn the true name of God. And that not even the priests to whom the name was revealed were to be permitted to voice it unless they were locked up in that inner sanctuary, that holy of holies, the ark of the covenant. And then when they were in that secret place, they could declare the word of God, the true name of God. Later, <clears throat> When King Solomon learned this great name, it enabled him to be the wise man of his day and the richest man of his day and to show forth to the world all of the wisdom, all of the might, all of the wealth that had come to him through the knowledge of the secret name. And he wanted to impart it to others, but he set a high price on it. He decreed <clears throat> that those who wanted it would have to work for it. 
and they would have to work until he was satisfied that they were ready to receive this word. Now you know what he meant by being ready. It didn't mean that they had had so many years of study or practice, but that they had attained a state of consciousness in which you could breathe that magic word without sending them out immediately trying to be gods. But the impatience of some of his men prevented the plan from being carried out and Solomon never imparted his secret. Never. In fact, it is only in the last century that the secret has been uncovered so that the world may know that King Solomon knew it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known that King Solomon actually had the secret, and it was the secret of his greatness. Now, Jesus also knew this secret. He knew that if an individual could once learn that God is closer than breathing and nearer than hands and feet, that the kingdom of God is within you, not in holy mountains, not in holy temples, not in holy teachers, not in holy books, that the kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. It is within you. He knew that if he could reveal this to his people, they would never again be slaves under Pharaoh, but they would also no longer be slaves under Caesar. He knew that they would enter a new kingdom under a new king and that they would find their complete freedom. Well, of course, we know that Caesar's legions felt that he would set up a temporal dynasty and destroy theirs. And there are many who would have you believe that he didn't mean to, but he did. Don't ever be fooled. Jesus knew that life would never be complete if you lived under a Caesar. By any name. By any name, in any form. He knew that life couldn't be complete if you weren't free. And that freedom had to be not only the freedom of the soul, it had to be the freedom of the body, the freedom of the mind, the freedom of the pocketbook. It had to be a complete and perfect freedom. The word must become flesh and dwell among us. And so he wasn't going to merely set up a spiritual kingdom that would leave a temporal state of bondage. The Hebrews, those of the hierarchy, understood full well that if men knew the truth that they could never continue their system of holding men mentally and physically and financially in slavery. They couldn't demand the best of men's crops or the first fruits of his money because man would know the source of his good. And he'd no longer have to buy the favors that a hierarchy can hand out in the form of prayers or whatever it is that they believe to be of value. And so the master went among his people 
doing the most daring thing that had ever been done on the face of the earth since time began. He went among the people on the streets by the seaside in the mountains even at the very doors of the temple and told the people the truth and he told them the truth that would make them free. He told them that the kingdom of God is within you and the name of it is I. I in the midst of you. If you destroy this temple, I will raise it up again. If there are ten righteous men in a city, you'll save the entire city. If only there are a few who know that there is a mystical, spiritual, infinite, divine presence within us, and that it has a still small voice with which it can speak to our awareness, even into these ears. And it can say to us, I will never leave thee. As I was with Moses, so I am with thee. I go before you to make the crooked places straight. I go before you to prepare a place for you. I am the resurrection and the life. I, in the midst of thee, am mighty. And so, because he revealed this truth. He was crucified. Crucified because that was the penalty for his particular crime. Today we have other forms of crucifixion, but they are always meted out to those who commit that same crime of revealing the truth. The difference today is that those who are declaring this truth openly, in plain language, are given little or no attention, and the few, there are a few, who are widely read, who give this message openly and outwardly, but no spiritual fruitage comes forth from them. In other words, there are no signs following. There is not the regeneration of life that one might expect. There is not the development of the spiritual nature as one might expect because the very openness of the message is aimed at the mind or intellect of a person and they sit and read it instead of first developing spiritually to the point where they can receive it in their inner consciousness. That is why the Master said, go and tell no man, go and show the priests. That is why in our classwork, our students are given this message, but they are asked and begged and pleaded with not to go out and talk it, 
reveal it or give it to anyone, but to let each be prepared in their own way until they reach the point of receptivity in which they can accept it and not go away with uh, the mind of an egomaniac. While human beings declare, I am God, I am spirit, or even I am spiritual, you may be assured of this, that they are missing the entire point, and thereby losing the opportunity for the demonstration of their true identity, which is Christhood. The person who says, I am Christ, is a liar. The person who hears within their ears, knowest thou not, I am God, that person hears truly and has had their Christhood revealed to them. If you read it in a book, don't believe it. If you hear it with your ears, don't believe it. If you feel it in your heart or hear it from that still small voice, then it is so unto you. For this reason, you may never reveal this except in the same manner in which you have received it. In other words, when the grace of God has so prepared you, no, when the grace of God has so prepared a relative, a friend, a patient, or a student to where they are led up to such a moment as this, it may be given them. Not before. Because if it is given before there is a readiness for it, not only the moment is lost, a whole incarnation may be lost. When we are willing for those who are led to us to be led step by step, gently, peaceably, calmly, until in such such moment as this the revelation is given them, sometimes not even in words, Sometimes in a meditation it's revealed to them within their own being. Often the teacher has no need ever to say these things in words to a student. There is a center within you. There is a Christ. There is a presence. There is a Son of God. And it is your true being and your true identity. And when you say, I, ordinarily you mean, I, Joel, Bill, Mary, you are using the word in its limited, finite sense and uh, you have no right to declare divinity for it. But as you learn through practicing the presence and meditation and inner communion to be still and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. I will listen for thy voice until from within there comes an impartation like this 
then you will know that this is truth. Then it is as if a seed of truth were planted in you. And uh, this must be kept as sacred and as secret as the seeds you plant in the ground. It must be taken down into Egypt and kept away from the human mind. And so only in secrecy, only in silence and in sacredness can you commune with the I that I am, with my inner being, and there realize, it is true, thou wilt never leave me nor forsake me. Thou, the very I of my being, thy very presence is my bread and my wine and my water. Thy very presence is my life eternal. Thy very presence will restore unto me the lost years of the locust. Thy presence in the midst of me is my salvation. Thou and I are one. Whithersoever thou goest, I go. Whithersoever I go, thou goest with me. For we are one and not two. One is the inner the reality and the other is the outer or the visible and the manifest. But we are one and I am fed from within. I am supported and maintained and supplied from within. My strength is from within. My eternality is from within. My wisdom, my life, my love is from within. I do not look to man whose breath is in his nostril, though I'm certainly happy to share with all those on my path. I need not look to man whose breath is in his nostril, nor need I ever fear man whose breath is in his nostrils, for I have no need to fear what mortal man can do to me when in the midst of me is the Almighty, the All Power, the Infinite, the Supreme, the Divine, the All, the Eternal, the from everlasting to everlasting, that which has been with me from the beginning and ushered me into this human life, that which has accompanied me at every step, even though many times I've been unaware of it and even have ignored it, Yet it has always been closer to me than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, awaiting my recognition. And I know now that it not only will be with me forever, it will go before me even while it is being with me. And it will prepare every place into which I travel near or far, here or there, for the kingdom of God is where I am, in health or in sickness, in saintliness or in sinfulness, in poverty or in wealth, wherever I am, the recognition of this I am will restore the lost years of the locust will rebuild the temple that my forgetfulness has destroyed it forgives seventy times seven every sin and every offense it carries no memory of anything beyond this minute it knows no past it knows no future. It is the now of my existence in which even though I was scarlet, I am in this instant white as snow. 
Now are my sins forgiven me. You see, the first and greatest sin is the sense of separation which has come between us and the divinity of our being. Therefore, the first sin to be overcome must be that sense of separation and the only way in which it can be done is ye shall know the truth. And the truth is that thou art closer to me than breathing and nearer than hands and feet and thou art and I am. And we are one. And all that thou hast is mine. All that thou art I am for we are one. Then a mistake has crept into the theological life of the world. It's a mistake that had its beginning in paganism and because it was so strongly entrenched it came across into Judaism, into Christianity and now it is accepted in uh, all of the teachings of the world ignorantly of course in pagan days when evils appeared on earth beyond the ability of man to solve they turned to an unknown God. They turned in hopes that there was something greater than humanhood, something that could come to know of their distress and have the power to alleviate it. And thus began this paganistic practice of praying to God for help for supply for help for whatever it was that seemed to be absent protection, safety, security only because there was so little response did they have to create a dozen different gods and hope that from one they would achieve this and from that one they would achieve the other. But even though Father Abraham gave to the world a monotheistic religion, throwing out all of these so-called gods and replacing it with but one god, He still, well, let's not blame him. Again, we have too few records. We may not blame him, but at least we can know this and do know this, that the Hebrews went to that one God in the same way that the pagans had gone to 12 gods. They went for the same things. Safety, security, my supply, my help save my troops, kill my enemies. They perpetuated the work of the pagans only uh, appealing to one God instead of a dozen. And so the same practice now permeates all religions and uh, the attempt is made to go to God to have God do for us what we have failed to find a solution for ourselves. 
Therefore, it's much easier to say, well, I just don't know how to do it. God, now you do it. Than it is to persist in finding a solution. Now, all of this is based on the premise that made us humans to begin with. And that is the acceptance of a belief in two powers. That is what drove the divine spiritual Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. They accepted a belief in two powers, the power of good and the power of evil. The moment they did, they were no longer in Eden. They were out in the world of sweating for a livelihood, working hard, diligently and painfully. The return to Eden is not accomplished by praying to God for help. The return to Eden is accomplished by realizing that there are not now and never were two powers. There is no such thing as a power of evil, but neither is there a power of good. There is no such thing as two powers. There is no such thing really as one power. All that exists is God and God's government of his universe. And as you relax into that realization, harmony begins to appear. As long as you do not try to get a power of good to do something to a power of evil, as long as you do not try to get God to come down and fight your battles. As long as you do not try to have one power do something to another power. Be assured that all of the thousands of years in which people have suffered will only continue to be that many more thousands if they continue in the same ignorance. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so, we will, through practicing the presence of God, and through meditation and communion, we will make contact, first of all, with the divine presence within us, until we too have an actual assurance that whithersoever I go, I go. Whithersoever God goes, I am. Whithersoever I am, God is. And all that the Father hath is mine. And then when we have that inner assurance and feeling, we will begin to live by grace. And then we will go over into the second step and understand why it is never necessary to turn to God to have our battles fought for us why it is that we do not need one power to overcome other powers, but that it is only necessary to abide in this truth. They have only the arm of flesh. And as we rest in that truth, we prove it. And that's what we will take up at our next lesson. Thank you.